Okay, so next up this morning, Casey Roma is an internationally recognized leader in digital media, brand, and storytelling. Casey has spent time working with Mercury, ANZ, Air New Zealand, and is currently the head of content at the Warehouse Group. And hot off her latest trip to Melbourne to speak at VidCon, we are delighted to welcome Casey to the DI stage to share her insights on the magic that happens when you connect people, data, and brand. Casey, please come to the stage. So that was pretty cool. I liked the use of magic quite a bit. So I'm going to start playing a little bit more in the storytelling and, and a magical game uh, for you. And then you get to go to have some morning tea. So how cool is that? Um, how many of you are in marketing teams? Oh, cool, cool. How many of you work really closely with marketing teams? Fantastic. That is much better than I've seen in the past. Um, You've got to start with a pithy quote, right? It's not a show if it's not a pithy quote. Welcome to a new era of marketing and service in which your brand is defined by those who experience. Brian Solis said that. Uh, does everybody know who Brian is? Brian's the dude who named social media social media. Over the past 15 years or so, he's become an anthropological, digital kind of guru. There's that word guru out of the United States. And we'll come to some of his data in just a minute when we talk about kind of the fragmented world we're living in when it comes to storytelling and communicating and interacting online. But the way I like to start is to kind of bring us all in the room together to understand the dichotomies of which we're living in with culture. Don't let this American accent fool you. I've been in New Zealand nearly 18 years. I just can't get rid of this accent. Um, <laughs> so this is all like quite Kiwi. I don't know how to be an American anymore. So uh, yeah, don't let that fool you. Right now we're more connected than we've ever have been, right? Right in our hands. I'm a little nervous right now because I left my phone in the back of the room. And I haven't done that in like years. I usually have it in my pocket. So I'm like, we're connected, but I'm really not. Um, I guess my watch counts. <laughs> we're more connected than ever, right? We've got the World Wide Web. We're all engrossed in it. We understand the implications of the connectivity that we've got from both human, empathetic, and just like granular levels. But at the same time that we're connected, we've also got these calls in culture to build a wall or to separate ourselves from others. It's a scary time, this connectivity. We don't quite understand culturally where we sit with it. We've got the Me Too movement. Now, this has opened up so much dialogue, so much understanding. I think guys understand women a bit better. I think women finally have a way to speak about what we've been going through forever, basically. But at the same time, the world is heralded by the Kardashians, <laughs> right? We've got me too going, no, 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 and then I've got my 13-year-old going, mom, what's a bud implant? Right? What's going on? We've got the fall of the macro. Who deals with influencers? Nobody. Oh, two, fantastic. The macro influencer, the uber celebrity, the total, nah, man. It's the rise of the micro, the small folks, the people that you know, the social currency, but have you ever talked to an expert or a guru? Like, what kind of a world are we living in now? It's, it's fascinating, it's interesting, and it all comes down to how we connect. We've got global warming. It's happening. <laughs> no matter your politics, the earth is heating up, and we have to do something about it. So we do things, I work for a big retailer. We talk a lot about and enact a lot of policies around ethical sourcing. We've got oceans filled with plastic, absolutely full with plastic. And then we've got Notre Dame. Do we wonder why those two are together? I found it fascinating that within a week of Notre Dame being set aflame, the world came together, the money to leak, and made enough money to build Notre Dame back up. That same amount of money could have cleaned all the oceans. It's just fascinating to me where our ethics and our morals are these days. We've got tech addiction. Again, I'm feeling better now <laughs> about my phone in the back. But how many of you have kids who just won't get off their devices? And so pulling my daughter off her phone is like extric you know, extricating an arm from her. But we do it. We've got millennial burnout. Millennials, 1981 plus, yes. Um, I never thought I'd say the words that I've spent half of my pay in the last year on therapy, but I have. And uh, Brene Brown calls it a great unraveling, so that's where I'm going to sit with the world. We're so connected. I can't remember the last time I actually switched off. I might have left work, I might have gone overseas, but 
Did I post something on LinkedIn so the algorithm still liked me? Let me catch this Instagram story, right? We live behind our phones. It's a fascinating, fascinating time when we talk about data and insight and analytics. We have to think about the humans, the actual animals we are behind these little screens. We've got data breaches, and hey, <laughs> Siri, Alexa, Google, how many of you have voice-activated little assistants and dots and things in your home? Yeah, I know how they work. They still scare the shit out of me. <laughs> I watch my three-year-old niece in Detroit, and she can work Alexa better than I can work my iPhone. It's fantastic, except Pippa is on all the time. Peppa, sorry, Peppa the pig. We've got Baby Shark, do 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 Baby Shark, do 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 I can't sing, guys. Help me out. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and we've got instant everything, right? The way that our phones and, and our connectivity has with us is that we need to be connected consistently. We always, and when we're connected, we have to have what we want here and now. We've got a blue dot generation. Does everybody know what the blue dot generation is? I love this. This is great. So we are not the blue dot generation, but our children are. Um, when I was a little girl, I grew up in San Diego, California, and my grandparents were in Missouri. Or as you say, when you're back in Missouri, Missouri. And we used to have this piece of paper that we'd pull out before we'd get in the car. We'd figure out where we were at one point, and the next at another point, and we'd figure out, oh, it's a map. Okay, we, know, we had to figure out where we were in the world to be able to get from my house to my grandparents' house. It was a four-day drive, like full-on four-day drive. But what that taught us was that we had to figure out where we fit in the rest of the world, whereas right now, you open up your phone, there's a blue flashing dot that tells you you are the center of the universe, right? You're the center of the universe. You don't need that paper map thing anymore. The universe comes to you. Your food comes to you. I live in Beach Haven, and we still don't have Uber Eats, so I don't know what that's like, <laughs> but I can't wait, right? Apparently, we've got a three-minute uh, time frame that we can take before we just cancel the Uber Eats. Online bullying and online safety are huge issues. We don't have enough protection, I think, for all of us, and that's not just in a business sense, but we have to start tackling these kinds of things. We've also got the fact that we're online all the time, which means the biggest seduction of life right now is getting offline. I have so many friends who are paying out the nose to go to Bali, to places where there are no bars, and not like these kind of bars, I mean bars on your phone, there's no Wi-Fi, and they just like, they chill out, man, they do yoga, they do retreats, it's cool, because we never get that anymore. It's so hard to put your phone down and pretend it doesn't exist. And then on March 15th this year, we had Christchurch. And for me, as somebody who's been working in the digital realm and the storytelling, more creative side of marketing for the past 15 years, Christchurch shook me to my core. I think it shook all of us Kiwis to our cores. And it's changed the way that governments are looking at social media. I mean, our prime minister is right now, the, I don't know if you guys saw the picture in the paper this morning of Jacinda and um, some of Facebook's execs, but we're having to tackle that and we're able to do that. New Zealand as a small country is so agile that we're able to lead the rest of the world. I won't leave us so heavy because I think that it's interesting to note, does anybody know what the most liked photo is on the most popular social media platform right now? Yeah, it's an egg. We were supposed to have flying cars and hoverboards and all those things by this year, but what humans are liking at scale is an egg. I've heard so much, man, it's genderless. It has, it has no religion, no skin, it's an egg. This is where we're at, so when we look at all of the data and we look and we try to dive into human insight at scale, it is so important to remember that before the egg was a Kardashian, and now we have an egg. So hopefully that will help you out. Um, Simon Sinek, Carmen, you mentioned Simon Sinek earlier. Um, I'm gonna show a little video from Simon. I hadn't seen this one before. Um, I found it a few months ago, and it just really, really grounded me, so I wanted to share it with you all. I can't even imagine what the suicide and, and homicide and just the rates of depression, you know, an accidental death due to overdose are gonna look like in the future. It's gonna reach epidemic proportions. It's already, the, 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 the statistics are already alarming and yet nobody's sounding any alarm bells. 
Parents have to intervene. We have to stop giving our kids free access to social media and, and phones at young ages. They are not ready for it. Their minds cannot cope with the dopamine. They can only have it up to a certain hour and you take it away. They're children. You can take the phone away. We've got to intervene as parents. But as companies, we now have to deal with the influx of kids that are coming into our companies with addiction. Watch, I see it all the time. Walk through any office. You'll see the older employees have their phones on the sides of their computers as they're working. You'll see the youngest employees have their phones face up in front of their keyboards between their arms as they're working. And this is how they work. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the science is alarming. They did uh, experiments on mice where they, they did the multitasking, they, they changed the, they changed, they put flashing lights to mimic going from the computer to the cell phone, the computer to the cell phone, to the TV. The mice that were exposed to the changing lights, it took them three times longer to solve a maze than the mice that weren't, and the damage was permanent. There is a subconscious reaction to these devices when we use them, okay? What if I were to hold my phone while I'm talking to you? I'm not checking it, it's not buzzing, it's not beeping, I'm not even, I'm nothing. I'm just holding it. Do you feel at this moment that you are the most important thing to me right now? No, you do not. Because there is a subconscious reaction we have to the device. When it is out, it makes the people around us feel that they are less important. So when walk, we're walking down the halls in our offices and somebody says, hey boss, can I ask you a question? You go, sure, what's on your mind? We've just told them they're not that important. Or we can go, sure, what's on your mind? And if you don't have a pocket, find a shelf, put it on the shelf, come back and say, sure, what's on your mind? When we show up to a meeting, or a lunch, or a dinner, with our colleagues, our clients, or our friends, or our families, and we put the phone on the table, we have announced to everyone in the room that they are not that important to us. And by the way, putting the phone upside down is not more polite. My favorite one is when the meeting or at a lunch with someone that the phone will ring and the caller ID will pop up and they will go, I'm not going to get it. Oh, so magnanimous. Oh, lucky to eat with you today. Or they could just put the damn thing away. You can tell how addicted we are. When somebody pulls out their phone when you're with them, how uncomfortable does that make us feel? You're walking down the street with someone, they pull their phone out. We feel stupid, so what do we do? We pull our phones out. We're so addicted, somebody goes to the bathroom when we're at dinner, and what do we have to sit there by ourselves? God forbid we should look around the room for five minutes. We pull our phones out. Meetings, awful. What do we do when a meeting happens, right? Everybody's sitting, waiting for the meeting to start. Bob's running a few minutes late. Bob's here? Okay, start the meeting. Do you know when relationships are built? All that in-between time. I like uh, that a lot because I see myself in it. Kind of guiltily see myself in that. Um, how many of you guys see yourself in that or your colleagues? Yeah, yeah. It's a good reminder to uh, put the phones down a bit and to just connect with people. Specifically, I've been putting mine away before meetings because I don't know what your businesses are like. We're a very heavy meeting business culture where, where I work. So having those five minutes or those five seconds or those 15 seconds to go, hey, how was your weekend? How's the kids? What are you up to? Um, it's super important. Before we go any further, I wanted to go back a little bit because to know where we're going, we have to know where we've been, right? We all know, I think most of us in here, looking at faces, what the world was like before the internet, right? And before we had connected TVs and Netflix and everything. And I can remember a time when we had literally 15 channels that we could watch. And across the USA, culturally, we had this interwoven narrative. We had to choose which channels we had um, and what we watched, and we watched by appointment. Now, that is obviously changed to, I call it selling our souls to the scroll or multitasking or multi-screening, whatever you're doing, our attention spans are growing shorter and shorter, not because we're goldfish, but because we've got dopamine rushing through us. Um, who was on the original The Facebook when it came out? There's a few. I can remember just sneaking in because I had an American University email address and my brother told me um, it was gonna be bigger than the MySpace thing. And I remember telling him like, look, <laughs> I'm the older sibling. This MySpace thing is gonna blow the Facebook out of the water. Um, I'm a storyteller now, he's a surgeon, you can tell who was right. 
Beyond that, we moved into kind of, I call this the tween years, the big six, where we're all knees and elbows and kind of awkward growing into like this new phase of humanity and connectedness and data and insight into how humans are now growing more ever connected, yet changing the way in which we act and react. And we move forward to where we are now, to this conversation prism. This is something that Brian Solis puts together, I think annually, it might be biannually. Um, it started about 11 years ago, and when he started, in the middle was a brand. So he would take a random brand, and he'd look at the ecosystem from which that brand was interacting with other people, and he'd start to extrapolate out where it sat in kind of the business strategic perspective. Now, what he realized really quickly, specifically as an anthropologist, was that you had to put a human in the center. And you had to break things down, not just by how we interact, but by the why and the what. So this is fascinating. If you've got time, look it up. The Conversation Prism, uh, Brian Solis. For me right now, I, going from Solis, I think the internet sometimes can be a little soulless. Um, and this is literally what I look like on a Friday night. People are moving more and more and more towards the delete, 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 delete. So how do we utilize data and insight and stories to keep people where we want them to be? Sometimes we over-egg things and it doesn't have to be so hard. But right now there's so much content and so little time. I don't know if your marketing department looks like this, but mine does. We're creating more content than our audience can actually consume. Well, that's a good topic for our next blog post, white paper, infographic, listicle, animated GIF. We have so many opportunities to share with people, to push content out in the world that we think we need to basically fill all of the spaces instead of being very concerted in our efforts around where it matters most and where the value is gonna be most. When we look back, whoa, 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 good thing I know this. In 1965, there were 884 minutes of content for every minute of human life, which means that 883 minutes of content in the era of TV, newspapers, and radio was never gonna be seen. If you move forward, Oh wow, good thing I know this. <laughs> in 2005, it reached closer to 1,000. When you get through to today, how many minutes per minute of humanity of content do you think is being delivered and created? It's 3,000 minutes. So 3,000 minute uh, 3, minutes of content for you, for you, for you, for you. Extrapolate that out to the billions of people on this planet, and there's too much for us to take in. It's over overwhelming because we're living in an attention economy. We inherently value less the contribution of any sponsor that brings us a content which we don't need. I quite often will sit with our teams, especially in our paid uh, teams, when we're looking at what we're gonna push out into the world and ask them what is the value. If there's a P&P &P ad for a box of chocolates at Valentine's Day when everybody else is gonna be sending out the same ad at the same time, what's the value? And if we can't figure that out, we go back to the drawing board because unless you're delivering quality, quantity will not help you win the proverbial game. In fact, I believe that in our modern media world that we are over-egging and over-indexing our spend on reach because we think that eyeballs equal impact, but I don't think they do. I don't know about you, but I've been told that I have the attention span of a goldfish. I think we've all been told that at some point, uh, if not by our digital agencies, then by some other folks. I can remember uh, when we first had to do some small little six second YouTube snippets to get people enticed or to interrupt them, to bring them into our business. I remember thinking, geez, they're, they're annoying. I just almost dropped an F-bomb, might happen. They're annoying, right? Anything that interrupts us annoys us these days. We're, there's just so much, and I highly, highly do not believe that we have the attention span of a goldfish because making impressions has to take precedence over buying impressions. My favorite quote of the day right now is that we don't have 30 seconds to be interrupted, but we have 30 minutes to hear a good story. We talked about Netflix earlier. How many of you love a midstream ad while you're watching a really cool piece of content? You do. You love a mid-roll ad? Yeah, I love a You do? Wow, fantastic. You're the first person in like 20,000 people I've spoken in front of that's ever said that. We should talk later. <laughs> I fucking hate them. And I, I 
started on Facebook was the first place I saw it. I don't watch long form content on Facebook. When it moved to YouTube, I won't watch it at YouTube. When I was working at NZME, I tweeted out, I hate these. Please brands don't buy them. Please marketers don't use them. Please distribution companies don't add them to your list. And I got hauled into the, one of the chief's offices going, well, we're gonna be selling them in the next three months. And I was like, oh shit. Um, but we don't like to be interrupted. That's why we, we do not have the attention spans of goldfish. We've got infinite attention spans. How many, has ever, how many of you guys have binged watched something on Netflix? Like an entire season of something. We've all binge watched something. My wife and I watched all eight seasons of Game of Thrones from season one, episode one, to the finale in a week and a half. <laughs> we, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I read the books while I was doing it. So my boss did ask, have you shown up to work? Yes, fantastic, but I made time. That's a lot of time and that's a big commitment, but that's because the story and the narrative was something that mattered to me, and I liked that. Which made me start to think a lot about data versus insights, or maybe it's data and insights when it comes to storytelling. I found this online and I quite liked it because I figure a lot of you like to have things in nice rows and understand how things flow. So if you go from data to information, and then information to like little connections, and then we pull that together as knowledge, and then you go, wow, something clicks, and you're like, that's an insight. And then we start to pull all of the insights together, we get knowledge. We caned it, right? Nailed it. Drop the mic, walk away, you did your job for the day, earn that paycheck. Nah. The way my brain works is more like this. Right? And I think this is how most of humanity works, too. We need to pepper in so much more than just some straight-line narrative about how data and insight work together. We cannot go down the road, when we talk about moral and ethical marketing, we cannot go down the road of getting people to be only data points and spreadsheets to our businesses. There are living, breathing humans behind every click, every view, every share, every purchase. Humans are not data points. Because, I mean, look, some cool human went like creativity. I'm gonna make that into a cat. What cool human did that? Some amazing human. I also really loved this visualization of going like, when we think about simplifying CX, whether it's online or in real life, we all start somewhere in that noise and uncertainty and patterns place, right? And then we simplify all of those things out. We nurture them to become that insight piece so that we can deliver clarity and focus. I don't know where all of you like to play, but as you can tell, I'm probably sitting on this side. I love diving in to the numbers and the data and then extrapolating out the why. Why did that emotively help somebody? Why did they unsubscribe? Why did they subscribe? And how am I gonna keep them coming back? I like to work all of this into four super, super, super easy steps, which I like to call the pyramid of brand. They're really, they're <laughs> just so, commonsensical, I guess. And a lot of the time we get so caught up in the nuance and all of the different marketing technologies and slang and everything else that we forget to just simplify this shit, right? We are the lucky ones. We are, the jobs that we do, we're not flying the planes, we're not saving people, we're not the doctors. We get to have fun with what we do. The first step of the brand is I know it, right? Unless somebody knows your brand, they're probably not gonna keep coming back and understanding you. So when you talk about this, it's like functionally, what are we doing? How are we reaching people? What's going on? I know it, I love that stage, it's great. I like it, I really like this brand. We've had some consistency, we've interacted with each other, they've been good to me, I like their product, it's fantastic, so right? I like it, what's next? I love it. I've had so many fantastic iterations of of exchanges with this brand that I love it. Now, I love Nike. I love Doc Martens. I must love shoes, that's what's coming out of this. <laughs> but I love those brands because consistently throughout a long period of my lifetime, those, those brands have been with me. They've literally walked with me where I've gone. Now, I haven't quite gotten to the next stage, which is, which is I live it. This is where people just wear the brand, literally on their sleeves. My ex-husband has five friends who when they were 19, all five of them got Steinlager tattoos. <laughs> They're now in their mid-50s. <laughs> Can't really tell what tattoo is. But they still love the brand and they only drink Steinies. 
It's, so it's, they, they absolutely live the brand. And when we talk about different l levels of data and you're cutting everything and you're trying to find insights, if you break your brand and your marketing into four simple patterns like this, you'll be winning. But don't believe me, believe some really nerdy, geeky information that comes off the back of the IPA study done by Les Binet and Peter Field. Um, how many of you have read the IPA? It's fantastic. It's 88 pages of a rollicking ride of quantitative data that basically... <laughs> nah. um, I read it probably four or five times, each time with a gin or two, and I learned something more, <laughs> which is great. But if you extrapolate all 88 pages down into something, what it looks like is that at the top of the brand is storytelling, right? That's your long-term prospects. That's the I know it kind of part of the funnel. When you look at the long term, you, you get later paybacks, but better paybacks. When you work your way down this kind of consistent marketing funnel towards tactical sales or that digital sweet point at the bottom of the funnel, it's in the short term. And what we see over, I think they had 2,000, 3,000 different brands over the course of a decade was that if you're doing your direct response campaigns, your tactical marketing campaigns based simply on data points, cool, you're gonna have 14% share of growth over time and that's, that's not something to sneeze at, right? That's pretty good. But the second you start to layer emotive storytelling and give people a reason, that why that Carmen talked about, once you start putting that on top of everything else, your share of voice, your revenue, and your growth jumps significantly. Brands like Air New, Ze Air New Zealand do that really well. Nike does that really well. Um, a lot of the big telcos here do it super, super well. Um, so it's just understanding that stories aren't just the fluff. They're not just for coloring in. I really love this piece of um, uh, information that came out about a month ago, and it's talking about um, reducing variability. So how you can eliminate terrible and great experiences. And what it basically says at the end, um, I love, because it talks about consistent mediocrity. So if we th I think about McDonald's or Starbucks when I see this, I'm going, yeah, I'll go into any Starbucks in the world and get a latte, and I know what I'm getting. I might not like it, a latte, Sorry, dad jokes. <laughs> there was going to be at least one. Um, but I know what I'm going to get, right? So that's fantastic. But what happens when you play in the realm of consistent mediocrity and you're always giving people consistent um, value, as it were, is you miss out on the magic. You miss out on the good customer stories, that really embedding of connection that brands need to have to move down that brand funnel to from I like it to I love it to potentially I live it. Um, which is where I'm gonna to go to with the purpose. We're gonna talk about the power of purpose in a brand. Because I know this, this terminology has been thrown around a lot lately. Purpose-driven businesses, right? Everybody's purpose-driven. Everybody's using the word ethical. Everybody's throwing moral into conversation, but what does it mean and what do some of the better players look like? Most of them are change agents, and as Carmen said too, most of it starts at the top. And I know that's hard if we're not sitting at the top and can't be that change agent, but like me, rah, rah, be a cheerleader if you can in your own way. Has anybody heard of Wild Fang out of the States? No, fantastic. So Wild Fang, strangely enough, is my favorite brand right now in the world. It has been built by two women who were ex-Nike execs, strangely enough, um, and it was built on a foundation of activism. In kind of this Me Too era, these two women who built the company went, women are having a hard time finding shirts to wear to work. If you buy a man's shirt that's a button-up, it kind of pops open in the front. We don't really want that. Um, otherwise, we have to buy something that's ill-fitting or that looks maybe a bit more feminine than people in a more kind of non-binary type world want. So what they did is they built from them up in the exec suite all the way down to the people sitting at the till in LA and in Oregon. They said, we want you to be activists but we want you to be activists in your own way. You can whisper and be an activist. You can just show up to work with the shaved head and that can be your activism. Or you can walk on the front lines with us as you like. So I think that's a, like, it was total purpose, total drive towards that. And what they did last year was when the First Lady of the United States wore this jacket that says, I really don't care, do you? As she got on a plane to go to the border to see children who'd been separated from their parents, um, the United States, well, most of the United States, got a little bit hot under the collar. I mean, there are people with her. <laughs> she knew what she was doing. 
And the wild fang ladies went, we don't like this. First of all, we don't like that children are being pulled from their parents at the border. And second of all, this is the first lady of the United States. What the actual? Like, what the actual? She's a mother, come on. So what they did is they said, hey, we wanna change the narrative. We wanna flip it around. And instead of saying, I don't care, we wanna say, I really care, don't you? And they mocked this up and they put it out to their base. They used all of the data and the analytics that they had to reach people that looked like their kinds of people. And they also utilized different distribution lists from organizations that they are aligned with. And they put this out and said, hey, we might not be able to get you this jacket for the next six months, depending on how many people order them, but every penny we earn will go to bringing kids back together with their families. And within five days, they'd earned 250,000 US dollars to help support Together Rising and bringing kids back together. At the same time, you've got this woman, the amazing Rose Marcario, she's Patagonia's CEO. When there were some law changes in the States around taxes, Patagonia, who is well known for saying, don't buy this jacket, from which Americans, being as we are, went out and bought their jackets in droves. Um, when they had $10 million in a tax cut, she went, nah, we're not gonna fill our pockets, we're not gonna put it back on the bottom line, we're gonna put it back into climate change, because she truly believes that the primacy of profit is killing the planet. So again, when we think about where we stand, every single one of us in this room, how, through how we do what we do daily, can actually make a change. We don't have to be the CEO of Patagonia. I wanted to show you a little bit of how Patagonia interweaves storytelling into their purpose and then pushes out content to their base. Hey, it's Leah. Just wanted to let you know I've been testing the powder bowl up here in BC the last month and the fabric's wearing pretty nice. It's been really durable, passes all my tests, and I definitely, yeah, I'd sign off on it. With this powder bowl redesign, we really work way upstream to make the most durable, long-lasting garment in Patagonia snow history. Our goal is to create the most sustainable fabrics without sacrificing performance. We start with recycled PET plastic bottles, chop them up, we clean them, melt them down, and we push the molten plastic through a spinneret that creates the actual filaments that is spun into yarn. And we take that yarn and we recycle fabric. The Powder Bowl series is one of our most iconic classic series of snow. We really wanted to refine and make it easier to repair. If this seam is here and it tears open, how do we repair it? If we walk on the back of our pants for a year and we need to replace a scuff guard, how easy is it to get in and untape and repair that piece? The reality is, out in the field, things break. Fabric tears, zippers fail. But that shouldn't be the end of the life of the garment. Newer isn't always better. Let's use our creative skills and keep things going. When I open the closet, I'm looking for a jacket. What I'm looking for is reliability. Repairs, scuffs, heavy use. To me, that says it stood the test of time. Make your repair, put the jacket back on, weather another storm, keep on going. What I love about Patagonia is they actually walk the talk, right? They actually do what they say they're gonna do. Also with Nike, I, did everybody see the Kaepernick ads last year? I think they just won an Emmy for that. An Emmy, yeah, they won an Emmy for standing up for African-American rights in the United States. Now, a lot of people didn't like it, and that's fine. Nike, for the last 50 years, has lived and breathed on choosing which side of an issue they're gonna stand on, but because they have a purpose, they do create a much more engaged and long-term audience. When they talked um, about Kaepernick and they went forward with this, they thought, we're gonna take a huge hit. They did. They lost about, I think, two or three million dollars overnight, which isn't big for Nike, but the 3.4 billion they made over the three months afterwards was interesting. And it was also fantastic to see the Americans who didn't like Nike's stance um, burning Nike shoes. Some of them burned them while they were still on their feet, <laughs> which made us who like Nike go, yeah, cool, we're fine with that. Nike also wear um, their beliefs on their shirts, on their shoes, and they allow other people, um, I'm a part of the rainbow community, and when I go home every June and I see Nike's brought out a new rainbow collection, a Be True collection, I just feel like, like I'm seen and worthy. So when a brand can do that and connect in, with people at scale, it's magical. 
But when we talk about Nike and we talk about narrative, I wanted to share this next quick video with you because it just absolutely brings all the happy feels. If we show emotion, we're called dramatic. If we want to play against men, we're nuts. And if we dream of equal opportunity, delusional. When we stand for something, we're unhinged. It's super, it's gonna beat the cop down. When we're too good, there's something wrong with us. And if we get angry, we're hysterical, or rational, or just being crazy. But a woman running a marathon was crazy. Officials tried to pull her off the course. A woman boxing was crazy. A woman dunking? Crazy. Coaching an NBA team? Crazy. A woman competing in a hijab, changing her sport, landing a double cork 1080? or winning 23 Grand Slams, having a baby, and then coming back for more? Crazy, 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 and crazy. So if they want to call you crazy, fine. Show them what crazy can do. So I love that iteration of a Nike ad, first and foremost, because what they did is they took everything they knew about their consumer base that was already engaged. They've got a huge push towards women and retail. But in that, nobody asked you to buy the shoes, nobody asked you to buy the shirt. And in fact, did you notice that there were three different points at which Adidas and Reebok showed heavily? And Nike like, we don't care. We're telling a story. And we know people will like us. They might even love us if we tell a really good story. I want to talk about people and trust for a minute. In the days of the influencer, close your eyes for me, please. Right, think about somebody in your life who's had a huge influence on you. It could be your parents, grandparents, a mentor. Think about what they look like, their face, their voice when they say your name, and smile. Open your eyes, please. How many of you thought of somebody in your family? A work friend or a good friend? Yeah, how many of you thought of Kim Kardashian? <laughs> I have had one person raise their hand before, and she was like, Kim, Kim, and I was like, oh, fool, we gotta move on. The reason I mention this is because we get wrapped up as business people and when we're analyzing data and we're going, what's the insight? And we're thinking about influence and influencers. And I've just spent the last week in Australia with some of the biggest influencers on the planet. And what I can take from that is that our peers are the most magical, magical resource we've got. How can you utilize the data that you've got to turn it into an insight that allows for a social currency where peer-to-peer -peer sharing helps because our most powerful and magical resource really is a shared narrative. When somebody else takes your brand or your product narrative and starts to share it as part of their own, that is the most magic you'll ever, ever get. I wanted to talk quickly about how my brain kind of conceptualizes storytelling for brands and how we put data into different places in the scope of my day to day. And this is called the um, story cycle and it's written by a fellow called Park Howell out of Arizona and he's basically taken the hero's journey and instead of having 16 to 18 different points, he's put it into 10. And so what I look at is that where are people in that, that brand funnel and are they already at ritualization? Are they already people that we know? and that I can start sending more tactical stories to, or are they all the way to backstory, where they need to understand the business, where they need to understand the crux, the why, the where, and the how. You can break every single one of these things down into a multitude of different touch points and ways to talk to people, whether it's through social or email or whatever it is. My favorite piece is actually the stakes, because that's where you're telling people why it matters, what's at stake for them if they do interact with you or they don't. Where's the value proposition? But breaking all of this stuff down is, is slightly magical. I want to talk about riding the wave of social trends and influence really quickly because we cannot talk about digital and data and everything else today without talking about this. Who's on TikTok? Yeah, there's a billion humans on TikTok these days. 
I downloaded it last week and I started this thing called TikTok Happy Talk. And I started to ask kids to help me with TikTok. Man, the kids want to help the old lady. It's fantastic. Uh, what I love most about this is that's a real pig. <laughs> yeah, you didn't notice either, did you? Yeah, it's a real pig. Um, but I wanted to talk about this one because quite often we don't understand when we should be jumping onto social trends as brands. Um, when I was at Air New Zealand especially, it was probably the time when we had the most leeway to have conversations and do silly things. We uh, took part in the Running Man Challenge at the time, but flossing is now kind of, it's, it's over now, but it was a thing last summer. And I saw a lot of brands trying to figure out how they could utilize flossing through the use of their influencers to sell their banking app. And I'm like, well, you know, Katy Perry's cool. That kid's cooler. A lot of the time, if you've got the right to jump onto a social, social trend, it's cool, do it, but you'll only ever be as cool as this mom and these cops. And that's fine too. Most of us, when we hop into something where we haven't been invited, look like a drunk Ted dancing in a parking garage. <laughs> so when thinking about it, Extrapolate out all the numbers and the insights that you want, but use your common sense. The gut is an important, important way of understanding humanity. Now, I wanted to finish up with my favorite um, campaign of probably the last decade. Big call, but I'm going to make it. Has everybody seen this one, Nothing Beats a Londoner? Yeah, again, it's by Nike. In fact, in Cannes, they had to put together a new award specifically for this campaign because basically what Nike did, not basically what they did, was they took all of the data and the information they had around regionality and the way that people feel about their hometowns and they broke it into almost every single touch point and every iteration of influence that they could to build one hell of a campaign. So I'd like to show this to you. Welcome to London. Nike wanted to connect deeper with the youth here than ever before. We learned that despite the incredible hardships they face, this generation of Londoners have the same resilient mindset and swagger as elite athletes. So we flipped the model and made them the heroes. In a city where Nike is pronounced Nike, we started with an icon and dropped a limited run of t-shirts on Instagram, Snapchat and Twitter to get the hype beast talking. Then we gave LDNR meaning. We cast 258 real London kids to be the stars of a social first modular film. Competing with one another, are you serious? not about how good they are, but how hard they have it. No one plays ice hockey in London. Because in sport, the tougher you have it, the tougher you can become. <laughs> These kids were supported with cameos from their London heroes. What's wrong with Peckham? We had to speak to them on their level. Morning. So every detail captured their London. From the true stories that inspired the script, to each location, to the London soundtrack and playground oh, slang. Man, you're begging it! By creating a modular film, we were able to launch it through the youth, to the youth, on Instagram. The king of grime, Skepta. I'm not getting on a cycle. Kicked off a chain reaction as the kids replied by posting their own hardships. Playing out the entire film, one scene at a time. Launching a battle of one downmanship across London. Stars and influencers featured in the film then commented on the kids' posts and shared them on their own social channels. The next day, the full film launched and went viral, trending number one on YouTube, earning its own Twitter moment, and getting shared organically by other stars. Oh man. Meanwhile, the kids were already unlocking gifts, social stickers, creating parodies, and earning LDNR teeth for their Xbox avatars. Then Swipe Up TV hit Snapchat and Instagram. Swipe Up. <laughs> Swipe up! Inviting kids to get on the website and sign up to take part in free sporting events all over the city. Starting with the native platforms of our audience was key to truly connecting with London's youth and giving them their very own version of Nike. And in doing so, help them realize they are just as inspiring as the megastars that they look up to. Get over yourself, man. Shut up. So that was absolutely cool, the way that they iterated it. The way that they would have had to pull together not only the strategy at the top of the funnel, but the tactics, the people, the numbers, the way that they thought social sharing and interaction was gonna be, then community management, then community engagement and all of that, just absolute, this is, this is my little happy place. So I'm gonna finish up real quick so you guys can have some coffee and some food um, and go with uh, some keys to success, right? So first and foremost, what's a presentation without Gene Simmons? Kiss, right, we all know kiss. Keep it simple, silly. 
Um, the simpler you can keep something, the more you can come up with a single source of truth, no matter how much data you have to extrapolate to get there, is the way that you will be able to move forward and make a lot more sense with the end consumer. The human on the other side is not a data point. It is a human with a busy life and is very important, just as important as the rest of us. Make it simple for them. Go back to basics. Connect those dots. If it's not making sense or if you think it's a good idea but your colleague goes, Oof, if one of our uh, competitors put that out, I probably wouldn't talk about it, then go back to basics. Connect those dots. Stand for something that matters. This isn't just a saying. It's not wishy-washy. People want to know what you stand for. They will wear their ethics these days. They will wear the companies that help them decide who they are and how they move through the world. When I say build and invest heavily in your community, that doesn't have to be in money. That can be in time and in understanding and just getting to know them. Harness the power of shared narratives because if you don't, someone else will own your story. You must own your brand story before someone else does. I get asked this all the time. We've already told our brand story. Tell it again. Tell it again and again and again. Keep saying it until people can tell it back in the same words that you told it in in the first place. And when that happens, then you don't have to tell it as much. You can start to tell different stories. But that, we talked about iterating quickly earlier with Carmen, that takes years, if not decades, to do. And don't take it from me, take it from Simon Sinek. We obviously have a little bit of a love affair with Simon. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Thank you for your time. <laughs>